Hello and welcome to Ratio Christi Television. What are some tests for the reliability of the Bible? I'm going to be talking to my next guest about three different tests, so that's what we're going to be talking about in this episode. Ratio Christi is the Campus Apologetics Alliance. We set up Christian apologetics clubs on university, college, community college, and high school campuses throughout the United States and internationally as well. Through apologetics, we're able to address the tough questions that people have about Christianity, different man-made religions out there, and also relevant world issues. The purpose of our organization is to help make people aware of the evidence for the Christian worldview and to point people to truth with a capital T, which is why we call our program Truth Matters. Joining me is Noah Myers. Noah is a native of Fort Collins, Colorado. He attended Capron Way Bible College in England and returned to Colorado, where he attended Colorado State University and uh, is a graduate with a philosophy major with a religion concentration, as well as an English minor. He is currently attending Southern Evangelical Seminary and hopes to graduate with a Master of, of Arts in Apologetics at the end of the summer. He's also the chapter director of Rosh Christi at Colorado State University. And you can find Noah blogging at beardeddisciple.com. And he just started a YouTube channel called Bearded Disciple as well, as well, where he keeps up to date apologetics topics and a growing list of resources for those who want to teach or learn apologetics. You can also find this Bearded Disciple on Twitter and even has a podcast as well. So Noah, welcome to Truth Matters. Thanks for having me, Tony. It's great to have you here. Noah, this is a topic that a lot of people uh, wonder about. There are many skeptics out there who uh, wonder, is the Bible actually reliable? And they start asking many skeptical questions about it. Now, we're looking, of course, to uh, the Gospels, which we find in the New Testament. Uh, what are three tests historians may use for, for the reliability of any book, and, and why are these valid tests? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a topic that I think is really interesting as I'm talking with students on campus and all those sort of things. What I find is a lot of times students start being a lot more skeptical when they're looking at the scripture for some reason and applying a lot higher level of skepticism to the scripture and don't really look at it in the same sort of way. So what these tests are, they're not necessarily one that if you went up to a historian and say, what are the three tests that historians use for the reliability of a book, that they're going to list these off. But based upon the standards and the things that these tests kind of go through, these are a really good way to kind of figure out what is true um, <clears throat> and whether a document's reliable. And so the first test is what we call honesty test. And it's basically just saying, is this source, at least with what we have, what was written, if we have what was originally written, did they at least believe what they wrote down? Um, so obviously there's sources and things that we can look at when someone reads Harry Potter. They're not looking at that, assuming that this actually happened because they know <clears throat> Rowling didn't intend that to be read as a historical source. Um, so did they actually believe these events happened? That's the first thing that we gotta understand. The second thing is understanding what we call the telephone test. And that's basically just testing is what we have now what the author originally wrote down. So maybe they did write down what they did believe actually did happen, but over years, kind of like a game of telephone, the message has been changed from what was originally written by those authors, and now what we have isn't really what the author originally attended, and so we can't now trust that because of those reasons. The last test is basically the corroboration test, and it's kind of looking at, all right, if we know that what they wrote down they believe was true, and we know that what they originally wrote down is what we have now, now we have to go and look at it and say, is there good reason to assume what they wrote down is actually true? Um, and that ends up looking at other sources outside of the writers themselves, the text themselves, does it acknowledge other things that we know were historically happening during the time period from other sources? Does archaeological sources, um, proofs, also confirm some of the things that this text talks about that we're, we're questioning? So that's kind of the three tests that we look at a little bit. 
Now, when we're out there sharing the gospel with people, whether they're family members, neighbors, friends, coworkers, etc., you know, we're giving them the good news. That's what the gospel means. We're out there sharing the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And yeah, I mean, we don't ever want to be sharing information that is false, but we say, hey, this is actually historically accurate information. So how do the gospels pass this honesty test? So with the honesty test, um, one of the first things is really just looking at the embarrassing things that are within the text itself. So when we see anybody who's kind of making up a story, they're going to try to get something from it. Um, usually in crime, it's just something of sex, power, or money. Those, those usually end up being kind of the motivational factors for someone um, giving, making up a story. But what we see throughout the Gospels is we see things like Jesus being going and calling Peter Satan. We see Peter denying Christ. Um, we see Peter um, multiple times just kind of ridiculed a little bit by Christ. We see things that Jesus even says that's just hard to take. Even just kind of, just kind of the idea of communion is a little bit hard to swallow in a lot of ways. And we see we, even within the text how... The other people listening to that story, listening to Jesus say, this is my bones, or this is my body and my blood, and them kind of shying away from that because it's a hard thing to take. So when you're making up a story, you're trying to make it look good. You're trying to make it something that people want to take in, and you're trying to make yourself look good if you're making up the story. We don't see the disciples and the people who wrote the Bible doing that. And then furthermore, we see that they were willing to die for that. If you're making up a story... You're not going to be willing to die for it if you know it's a lie. When somebody starts torturing you, that's the part where you're going to realize this isn't giving me the power or the money or the sexual prowess that I was hoping for. I'm going to deny that now. And since they don't do that, we have reason to think that they were being honest in what they wrote down. And when we're out there on campus talking with students, Many times we'll hear this accusation that the, the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, uh, you know, this is, these aren't the words of Jesus, or in other words, Jesus didn't write these themselves. It was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and they, they use this telephone test accusation. Like, yeah, you know, you tell someone one thing, they pass it on, they pass it on, they pass it on, and the last person has completely different information than the first person when they gave the original information. How do the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pass this common telephone test uh, accusation that people make all the time. Right. I think when I've dialogued with students on campus, what I've just realized is when they're kind of throwing out this idea that it has been changed over the years, um, it just shows to me that they haven't really looked at a lot of the ancient sources from that same time period. So when we look at, um, for instance, the Iliad, we have about 5,000 manuscripts or uh, excuse me, <clears throat> we have about 2,000 manuscripts for the Iliad. Um, and then it's close to 400 years after the events that the Iliad's supposed to record that we actually have Homer writing that down. And that seems like a pretty big gap, but that's small enough that historians are looking at that to say, this is probably what was originally written down. It's probably reliable. The number of manuscripts kind of ends up being significant because what that allows you to do is when you're looking at all of these different manuscripts, when there's a change to one, you can kind of check it with the others to figure out what was originally written. And so the more manuscripts that you have, the more you can trust that what you have is what was originally written by the authors. So when the Iliad has about 2,000, that's pretty reliable. When we look at other sources from that time period, we have others like Plato that's closer to 200, a little over 200 manuscripts, but that's still viewed as reliable. When we look at the New Testament, though, we're looking at 5,200, um, much more manuscripts. That gives us a lot more reliability. Plus, it's a lot closer to the events, specifically when we're looking at the Gospels. Even if they were written not by the disciples themselves, but by people who knew them, would at least be reasonable to assume, because even the most liberal estimates Luke would be written maybe 100, 110 years after the events that it's recording. So it's still very, very close to the events it's recording, especially compared to other documents from that time period. When we look at Caesar's Gaelic Wars, that's actually written almost a thousand years after the time of Caesar and what happened in that story. But we look at that as being reliable. 
So when we have only a hundred year gap, there's not enough real time even to have the story change without eyewitnesses either correcting or someone who knew an eyewitness correcting what's being changed there. And not surprisingly, we don't ever really hear college students uh, questioning those two books you just mentioned. It's always the book that has something to do with where they will spend eternity when it comes to morality and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but people need to realize that there's more manuscript evidence for the Bible than any other book from antiquity. If someone wants to say, hey, you can't trust the Bible, well, then you can't trust anything from ancient antiquity. The manuscript evidence is just so overwhelming compared to other books. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous that people even make this claim that it isn't reliable. Obviously, if they're still doing that, because they haven't looked at this evidence for themselves. But there's a, another test that you mentioned earlier, and this is the uh, cooperation test. How do the Gospels pass that? Yeah, again, it just ends up being all of these different sources that end up compounding the message of what the Gospels are talking about. Um, so first of all, we have early church fathers, and some would even still try to say, well, this is still biased because these are the disciples of the disciples, um, or maybe one more generation removed than that. Um, and so they might say that it's biased to say that this is supporting evidence outside of Christianity itself. But still, you have eight different sources. You have Clement of Rome. You have um, Ignatius, Polycarp, Clement of An Alexandria. Hypolitus, um, Justin the Martyr, Origen, Cyprin, all of these guys are um, non-apostle writers, non-disciples. They're Christians, but they're still acknowledging, they're quoting scripture as the word of God, um, showing again that at least what we have was what was originally written. So you have all of those sources, but then you also have all these other sources that aren't even Christian, are completely denying the Christian message, saying that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, saying that he wasn't who he claimed he was. Um, sometimes sources that are would be adamantly opposed to the message of Christianity for multiple reasons. Um, Josephus, for instance, is one of the, the best sources that we have in some of the things that he talks about with Jesus. And he's a Jewish historian working for the Romans. So being Jewish, he doesn't want the message of Jesus getting out because he's denying Jesus as being the Messiah that Jesus claims he was. So he's not going to try to corroborate that, yet his writings do that. In the same way, him being working for the Romans and Jesus claiming to be the king of kings, that's another reason that as, uh, as an occupant, as a worker for the Roman government, he doesn't want to support that sort of view. But again, we have him supporting that at least the disciples believe that he rose from the dead. And that's not evidence to completely corroborate, but it, but it's enough to get us there and get us to a point where we can even get some pretty good evidence for the resurrection itself. So we have somebody like Josephus, we have the Jewish Talmud itself that uses even some of Jesus' own words as commentary to the Old Testament. Um, we have Suetonius, Tacitus, Lucian, um, Mara, Bara, Bar Serapion. All of these guys are supporting the Bible as being good evidence, and they're not Christian. And so that these guys are coming along and saying, yeah, this has legitimacy to it. They're not denying really um, the basic historic things of it. They'll deny some of the claims of Christianity. Um, that seems to be really good evidence, once again, for us to say, all right, this seems to have good reason for us to support it, just as we would test any other document. And this is really good information to bring up to people because people don't realize that, oh, there are actually unbiased sources that back this up. No, I was just at an evangelism conference a couple of days ago, and I, I spoke. My talk was called Fabricating Jesus, How the Cults Distort the Gospel of Christ. And I explained the view of Christ according to uh, different theological cults out there, what the gospel is according to them. And then I asked, so who is the historical Jesus? And I said, I said, notice I didn't ask the biblical Jesus. You want to know the biblical Jesus, just read the Bible. <laughs> I said, what, what does history right. say about, about Jesus? You know, non-biblical sources. And the ones that you just named, I mean, these are non-Christian and even anti-Christian sources. And right. their descriptions I mean, of Jesus back back up. The, the, the Jesus of history who actually corresponds to reality. 
Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Even just looking at those sources, we're able to get enough to tell us that um, they believe that he rose from the dead, that they changed their their schedule as far as when they would celebrate the Sabbath. They're changing all of these religious traditions because of what they all of a sudden believe of who Jesus was, which especially with Jewish culture, sometimes people kind of bat that away as being insignificant. But we, what we have to keep in mind is how much Jewish culture throughout the centuries, since the beginning, has lived among these pagan cultures, these pagan religions, and still stuck completely to their beliefs. So that all of a sudden you would have these very well dedicated Jewish men changing all of these, it's really significant. And especially their willingness to die for that is something that we need to keep in mind as being good reason to believe that what they said was true. Now, why is it so significant that the gospel writers were willing to die for what they believe? I mean, you hear it say, you hear it said that, you know, many people will live for a lie, but not many people will die for a lie. So why is their willingness to die so significant here? Right. So I think that illustrates a few different things. First of all, it illustrates that it's important to them. So if you and I made up some sort of story, but it's kind of just a white lie, it's not really that important. When somebody comes along and, and is starting to persecute us for that, to one extent or another, um, especially when it's getting to the point of death and really harsh torture, some of the tortures that we have recorded that the Romans did to some of these disciples is extremely brutal. Things like boiling them almost like they're lobsters in a stew. Um, and that sort of thing that if that's something that they're just making up, but they don't really care about, you're not going to stick with that story. Eventually you're going to say, I know if I just deny this story, they're going to let me go. That seems worth it. But we don't see the disciples doing that. So that shows that at least it's important to them. It shows also that they really did believe what they were saying. The significance of that sometimes is misunderstood because a lot of times people will bring up, well, religions, people from all sorts of religions have died for what they believed was true. So all these other martyrs from other religions seem to kind of negate the importance of Jesus' disciples doing the same sort of thing because all these other religions do the same. Well, what's different about Jesus' disciples is we're looking at disciples who would know they were there. Um, so if they really believed that, it'd be one thing for somebody in our age to die for that because we're trusting their testimony to that. If I'm willing to die for believing that one of my friends was at the Super Bowl, that's one thing. But if I was there at the Super Bowl and claimed, yeah, I saw him there, that holds more significance because now I'm an eyewitness to that event. And so that's what holds the martyrs, martyrdom of the disciples a lot more important than other religious leaders because when you look at those, what they're taking on faith, they're truly taking on faith. They don't really have evidence to look at it themselves. They weren't there themselves. The disciples were, and that changes everything. Now, now some people uh, make the accusation that the Gospels are based on ancient myths that actually predate the Gospels. Uh, what problem do you see with that claim? Yeah, this is one that's really interesting to me because once you've done just a little bit of research, there's really not much evidence for it whatsoever. But I'm finding more and more that it's something that's brought up on campuses, and I think it's in a lot of ways result of how this next generation is kind of finding information. Um, a lot of it comes really straight off of YouTube, and a lot of times these YouTubers aren't getting it from sources themselves. They're getting it from someone else who read a book who maybe wasn't really that great of a source to begin with anyways. Um, so some of it really, when you trace it back far enough, it traces back to James Frazier, who wrote this book called The Golden Bow. And it basically what it's trying to claim is that all these other religions had these rising and dying gods that a lot of times died for their disciples, died for the people that believed in them to save them from their sins, that they rose again in three days. Oftentimes they were crucified. Maybe they were born on December 25th. Maybe they had 12 disciples. And so they look at this and say they have all these parallels, plus they predate Jesus. 
So what they're trying to push out is to say, that's where the story of Jesus really comes from. And they're kind of combining that with the telephone test and saying that the, the Gospels fail that test to say it's really based upon these other mythologies that predate Jesus. And that's really where this story is coming from. And it's slowly evolved into copying these other religions. So it's a copycat religion is what Christianity is, is what they're trying to claim. But when you do any research into those, you realize that's not really true. But even first, even before we get into even some of those details, one of the things that's so ridiculous about it is, even if that was true, that's not evidence to say that it's wrong, that Jesus didn't actually do those things. You could have a bunch of religions that claim somebody did that, and then Jesus comes along and actually does that, and that doesn't mean that Jesus didn't actually do it. Um, we can look at JFK and Abraham Lincoln, and we can see all these crazy parallels between them. Uh, they were basically elected to Congress exactly 100 years separate from each other. They were both elected to presidency exactly 100 years separate from each other. They were both assassinated and shot in the head. Their, uh, Abraham Lincoln's assassin was shot, in a fe- shot him in a theater and was caught in a warehouse. And then we have JFKs who shot from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. All of these different parallels that end up making it seem like, well, we could argue that one of them or both of them never existed, but nobody believes that because just because they're parallel doesn't mean that one of them does doesn't exist. But then when we get into the actual evidence itself, then we also see that there's really not these parallels to begin with. So for instance, ISIS is claimed to be born on December 25th, has a father named Joseph, was baptized by an up the baptizer, had 12 disciples, was crucified between 12 thieves or between two thieves, that he walked on water and that he rose from the rose from the dead. Like, and that seems a little scary when we realize Isis is one of the gods of ancient Egypt way before Jesus. But when we actually look at the original sources, what did they actually say? We don't really have any evidence that he was born December 25th. Not that that's even a Christian thing to begin with. He doesn't have a father named Joseph. His father was Seb. He didn't have 12 disciples. The only thing that we have numbering his disciples was four, and that he had disciples isn't significant at all. Any god or religious leader, you would expect to have that. There's no evidence that he ever walked on water. He wasn't crucified between two thieves. He was killed by a scorpion. Um, He didn't rise from the dead. He became the ruler of the dead when he died and never had a chance to walk on earth again. So there's really none of that sort of support and then when we look at these other deities like Dionysus he was torn apart he wasn't crucified he didn't rise from the dead Krishna was shot with an arrow he didn't really rise from the dead in that sense and most most Hindus would also say that he never died period um Addis is mauled by a boar so all of these different gods that are supposed to be these dying and rising gods they don't fit the bill to begin with but even if they did it wouldn't mean that the Bible is inaccurate or that Jesus's story is wrong in itself. Not surprisingly, the skeptics always focus on the similarities and never the differences. They don't, they don't ever offer any of those. And the differences are what people need to look to to realize, hey, these can't be the same. They're not the same or any of that. Now, we only have a couple minutes left. I want to ask you, why can we view the Gospels as being more reliable than other so-called or claimed Gospels like uh, Gospel of Barnabas or some other new Gospel like the Book of Mormon, more, much, obviously much more recent, uh, or any of these other Gospels that people say, oh, well, why isn't this in the Bible, or what makes this different than these Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John you know, Gospels that you talk about? Right. Honestly, again, it's, it's just applying the same sort of test that any historian would apply. So when we look at our honesty test, when we look at the historical test, the corroboration test, the telephone test, those sort of things, these other gospels, claim gospels, can't really support. So the Book of Mormon, especially when we look at archaeology, there's really nothing. Yet they're trying to claim that there was these giant civilizations of Jewish people who came over early before the time of Jesus um, who brought horses, who brought all of these different things that are technologies that we know that they never had 
here in the United States or in the Americas as a whole, um, or animals that they supposedly brought over, we have no evidence of. Um, and the same goes with these giant civilizations that were supposed to be around from the same time. So there's really just not good evidence to, to see that it lines up in that way. Um, with the honesty test as well, you kind of have the fact that only Joseph ever sees the original text itself. Um, he's making all these claims, and the only person that really can confirm it is himself. Um, so the fact that you have multiple eyewitnesses with the Gospels, um, that ends up being significant in that way. When we look at the Gospel of Barnabas, it ends up being a lot of the same stuff. It's much further out that we have manuscripts supporting what it talks about. Not as many manuscripts. It's not not really historically seen as being nearly as close to the events that it's supposed to record. So it just fails these very logical historical texts. And is one reason why when somebody says the New Testament canon was kind of made up at the Council of Nicaea, I think there's good reason to just look at, well, let's look at these other so-called gospels by a historical perspective, which would be the ones that we would accept as being reliable based on that. I think we'd pretty much end up with the same ones that we have now. Um, so it's kind of important to realize it's not that the councils in those ages were making up what was in those Gospels. They discovered what Gospels should be there. Amen. Noah, I sure hope that high schoolers and parents throughout the world watch this show, share it with people who they know, because this right here, these, just these answers will help dispel so many accusations and, and, and myths of, oh, the Gospels aren't reliable or anything like that. If we can use these apologetics to destroy the intellectual walls and barriers, this clears the path to share the Gospel clearly and effectively. So thank you so much for being on Truth Matters today and giving these great answers to our audience. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Friends, check out Noah's website. Check out his Twitter account, his podcast. Remember, Bearded Disciple is where you can find him. Just go and go to these different sites. You can find his uh, YouTube channel as well. Get this information. Get these answers out to your friends who are making these accusations all the time. But through apologetics, again, we can defend the historic Christian faith. And, of course, do that while we are sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Gospels are very, very reliable. Please visit our website, rostrochristi.org, to find out more. Find out if we have chapters near you. If we don't, let's get one set up as soon as possible. Also, please pray for this ministry and support Rostro Christi financially. That will allow this vital work to continue. And remember, when it comes to what we believe and why we believe it, truth matters. 